it's a very full, uh, it's a very full uh, session today. Uh, so I want to get started on time. Um, the, we live in interesting times. Uh, I suspect some of you have noticed that. And um, uh, so I just wanted to give you a, just a little bit of an update on, on some of the things that are, that are going on. And then, then we'll, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Hoagie, who will introduce our speakers. But let me just say that, that one of the things that's, uh, that, that is part of, uh, of celebrating diversity is celebrating all forms of diversity. And I think that this session is really extremely important because our department um, has been dealing with uh, uh, transgender people ever since the, it was possible to uh, uh, go through the trans, uh, transgender procedures. We just didn't talk about it. We just didn't know what to do about it. And that's not a good state of affairs um, if we're taking care of people who bring uh, very, have very specific needs of us. So I think this is fantastic. I'm really thrilled that, that, to have this session uh, in our department today. Um, uh, next week, which is um, the, uh, uh, October 27th, we're going to have uh, Dr. Scott Langenecker from the University of Illinois in Chicago, who's going to be talking about, uh, of, uh, about how we can use neuroscience to make predictions about how people will, with depression uh, will go. Will they develop depression? Will they respond to specific treatments? Um, and will they have a, a favorable or a difficult course of their depression? So that should be a very interesting talk. And then on the, uh, the following Friday, which is the 3rd of November, we're going to have uh, the president of the Yale New Haven Health System, that's uh, Mr. Uh, Rick DeQuilla, and uh, Tom Balsazak, who's the uh, chief medical officer for Yale New Haven Hospital, to t tell the department about what's happening at Yale New Haven Hospital. And um, I think that this, this will be a really great session because a lot's happening at Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, and uh, uh, we don't, there's not enough that's shared with our department about what's going on there, innovative services, new in ways of uh, delivering care, I think this will be a great session, a good opportunity for you to hear about, hear about and learn about what's going on in the hospital. So those, those are the upcoming two weeks. Uh, uh, and now let me introduce Dr. Michael Hoagie, who's going to introduce our session today. Thank you, John, and uh, welcome everyone to this Grand Rounds um, on Diversity, which is sponsored by the psychology section of the Department of Psychiatry. I think a relatively little known fact is that half of the ladder track faculty in our department are now psychologists, and we have two very competitive internship training programs, one based at, uh, jointly at CMHC in Yale New Haven, and the other at the VA, and um, hundreds of uh, postdoctoral psychologists in our department as well. I'm delighted to let you know about the second uh, Diversity Grand Rounds that our uh, section will sponsor, which will be on April 20th, when two psychologists who have physical disabilities uh, will be here to talk about the psychological dimensions of physical disability and the implications of, uh, of that for not only clinical work, but also uh, recruiting and training people with physical disabilities within um, our own department. Several years ago, uh, one of our speakers today, Christy uh, Olszewski, uh, who was a very junior faculty member at the time, uh, and I did not know very well, called me to ask if I would serve as a mentor in a formal uh, mentorship program that, uh, that Yale had launched. And I consented, and we began with a number of uh, exercises, um, and those ended with me being led blindfolded by Christy through a maze <laughs> in the HR building um, that's, uh, that's run by Yale. Uh, we've had many, many discussions since that time in our relationship about the culture of Yale, about research, about teaching, the challenge of writing, the challenge of finding good ideas to write about, and about leading a rich personal life while being a, uh, a faculty member here. And we've also talked about the enjoyable ridiculousness of wandering around Yale in a blindfold. <laughs> The moral of this short story for the junior faculty, if there is one to offer, is that mentoring is an active participant sport. Think about what you're looking for and think about what you need and go 
actively find it. Ask people for what you're looking for in this environment. There are many busy people here, but they're also very, very generous with their time. And the story is a reminder for the more senior faculty of the rewards and renewal that are possible by engaging in such relationships with young faculty who have boundless energy and a fresh perspective. And in Christie's case, what her friends call her excessive enthusiasm. <laughs> Uh, more formally, Dr. Olszewski obtained her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Albany. She did a postdoc at uh, Harvard Medical School based in Mass General. She subsequently worked in New York evaluating and treating children and adolescents who were the victims of sexual crimes or perpetrators of such crimes. She joined our faculty uh, just in 2013 and is based at the West Haven Mental Health Clinic and is the director of the Yale Pediatric Gender Program, which she and her colleagues will talk about today. We are, uh, owe a debt of gratitude to Christy and to her primary mentor, Dr. Tom McMahon, for building connections with others around the university and other departments um, around this work. And uh, Christy will um, introduce to you her colleagues, Drs. Bulwer uh, and Patel. They'll be talking about the transgender um, issue, which is perhaps one of the most complex medical, psychological, ethical and legal issues of our time. I give you Dr. Olszewski. All right, hi everybody, thanks for being here. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes? If you can't hear me, please um, just start going like this. And if I get too fast in my uh, talking, then I need this. Okay, so I'm going to try to see this and this. Okay, so I am here with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Susan Bulwer and Dr. Anisha Patel, who are in the Department of Pediatrics section of Endocrinology. And we are very excited to talk to you today about working with uh, trans children, youth, uh, adolescents, and young adults. So just to start us off, I'm going to have a brief agenda here just to kind of think about where we're going to be going. I'm going to be talking about gender identity, then we're going to talk about transphobia, the role of mental health in treatment. I'm going to then pass it along to Dr. Susan Bowler, who's going to discuss medical interventions. And then Dr. Nisha Patel will talk about a case study, fertility options, and our interdisciplinary program. If we can do that in an hour, it's going to be amazing. So um, we hopefully will have time for questions at the end. I start off with this picture. Tell me, how would you describe this child? Anyone? 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 Female. Female. Why female? It's like I put you in the audience. <laughs> um, yes. So we see uh, what would be typically a female right here with a dress, shoes. What else did you say? Hair? I did not. Oh, you did not. Oh, sorry. Hat. Anybody else? No? Would, do people agree? Female? Dress? Hair? Hat? Oh, I heard a no. Why? This does not look like a particularly gendered person. It looks like an unhappy or sad person. <laughs> ah, an unhappy person. It looks more like a costume person or a photograph. Uh-huh. Does anyone know who this is? This is FDR, yeah, our 32nd president, um, wearing typical dress of the time. Um, children before the age of six up uh, until the 19th century were dressed in white dresses. Uh, they were easy to play in and they were easy to clean. And uh, this was very typical up until the sixth birthday when hair would be cut and individuals would be um, would wear dress appropriate with their gender. Now, this changed in the 19th century when um, actually they started dressing children in more gendered clothing as young babies. Um, and interestingly enough, it was girls who were dressed in blue because it was seen as a very soft color and boys were dressed in pink as it was seen as a strong color. It wasn't until the 1940s when a marketing agency said, you know what, we could probably make a little bit more money if we switch this that it was switched. Interesting fact. So I, I put this picture up here for two reasons. Is first, 
to think about what our assumptions are when we see people, so checking our assumptions at the door, and then second, to think about how society really plays an effect on how we view gender norms. So the old way that we used to look at uh, gender identity was in a very binary model, meaning that your chromosomal sex was congruent with your gender identity and your expression, and from a heteronormative model that you were supposed to be interested in the opposite sex. The way that we are looking at it now is a little bit more complicated in that individuals whose uh, chromosomal sex might not match their gender identity or their particular gender roles, and they might be more fluid than what we have seen in the past, uh, or we're a little bit more accepting in our society of this. And sexual orientation is seen as something completely separate. Now, the way that we sometimes can separate these things out is by utilizing something like the gender-bred person, where you can see that there's a separation between an identity, one's orientation, sexual orientation, their chromosomal sex, and how they express themselves. This is a, also a pretty binary way of looking at these. If you can see on the side, um, the way the gender-bred person was first <coughs> conceptualized was that this gender identity was, again, on uh, a continuum from being more male to more female. Um, and the way that we're looking at it now is it's even more complex than that. So instead of seeing things on one continuum from more male to more female, we're seeing that you can have an identity that's from no female to a lot of female identity and from no male to a lot of male identity or somewhere in between, and you can be fluid on these different um, pieces. And you can also be a little bit male and a little bit female. So this offers a more complex picture of gender identity and gender expression than what we had been seeing in the past. We oftentimes use the term transgender, and I just would like to note that transgender, this term that we're using, oftentimes includes many different identities. And not everybody who is underneath the transgender umbrella identifies as transgender, but this is also a way for us to make the distinction between someone who's transgender, whose gender identity is not congruent with their chromosomal sex, versus someone who's cisgender, which you can see up at the top, which is someone whose chromosomal sex is congruent with their gender identity. So I just want to point that out, that oftentimes we use this term transgender, but it's very important to understand actually how that individual identifies. They might not identify as transgender if they identify as, let's say, genderqueer. So I just want to point that out. And the other thing to point out is that transitions are very individual. So if an individual is transgender, they may choose to socially transition using different pronouns or dressing in a certain way. Uh, they may choose to have hormonal changes. They may choose surgical changes. Or they may choose a combination of the above or none of the above and still identify as transgender. So it's really important to treat each individual as an individual to understand their gender journey. I think it's really important to think about transphobia and mental health also. Um, what we have seen is that there is a high rate of mental health issues in the trans population, high rate of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts, inpatient hospitalizations, outpatient treatment, cutting. So the question is, you know, why? We also see a really high rate of suicide. Some studies would suggest up to 45% a suicide rate in the trans population, which is in contrast to 4.6% of the general population. And we see an increase in youth also um, in, in suicidal attempts. Um, so why? Why is this? Well, Ryland, Testa, and colleagues, is this, is this clear for people on the back? Can you see this OK? Hopefully? Yeah. Yes? OK, awesome. Thanks. I like the thumbs up. Um, so Ryland, Testa, and colleagues really tried to understand what is a model of understanding why trans individuals specifically have such high rates of uh, mental health concerns and medical concerns. Well, what, is, what they found is that discrimination, rejection, victimization, and non-affirmation all lead to negative mental health and medical outcomes. They also lead to an internalized transphobia in an individual, negative expectations about what will happen in the future, and 
concealment of one's identity because individuals are afraid to be who they are in the general population. That also can lead to the negative mental and physical health outcomes. What we see as protective factors are community connectedness and pride. But if you don't have the community connectedness and pride, then there's a real problem, right? So I ask myself and I ask you all to think, how are trans individuals treated in the community? And I think, you know, Dr. Crystal, you had astutely said that we may have been treating this population for a long time, but do we know how to treat this population, right? And there was a survey that was completed in 2010 and updated in 2015 asking trans individuals about their health care. How have they been treated in medical settings? How have they been treated in employment settings, in you know, um, offices like the DMV or any other social service agencies that we might be attending? And what we found were some pretty staggering results of a lot of victimization in those specific areas. Um, you know, specifically when thinking about the hospital-based settings, you know, 50% in 2010 felt like they had to educate their providers on what it meant to be trans and were being either refused medical treatment or were being verbally or physically harassed in a treatment setting. I mean, thankfully, if you look at the 2015 numbers, we're getting a little bit better. I mean, there's much more, uh, many more respondents uh, versus the 2010 survey, which could have an effect on that. But it seems like we're doing better, at least in educating our providers and how to provide treatment to this population. Um, however, when you think about Connecticut, in 2015, they actually took the data and looked at, at it state by state. And um, we still see a high percentage of people being fired or denied promotions. Um, a high percentage of people experiencing negative treatment, and that includes having to uh, tell their providers, explain what being transgender is and how to treat them, or being verbally or physically harassed in a medical setting. Uh, also, we're seeing people avoiding public restrooms because of either hearing about um, different abuses that happened in bathrooms or being afraid of what will happen, and being denied equal treatment in public spaces. And public spaces, again, includes um, places like the DMV or social services, et cetera. So being actually denied treatment in 2015. I also was really surprised that 10% of people responded that they, they had undergone uh, reparative therapy or had been subjected to reparative therapy. I would like to see an update because in May there was um, legislation passed in the state of Connecticut to ban reparative therapy, which is awesome, um, but my guess is that there are still providers out there that are engaging in it. So um, that to me was way too high. If you look at schools, what we're seeing is victimization in schools as well. So you're seeing over here 75% of kids feeling unsafe, 74% verbally harassed, 32% physically harassed, um, and 16% physically assaulted. I mean, those are really, really high rates of kids getting assaulted and harassed in school. And as you can see, there's a 15% dropout rate. I can tell you from our work anecdotally, we have seen a lot of kids dropping out of school because of what's happening to them and the victimization that's occurring. We are also finding with without family support that these kids have higher rates of attempted suicide, depression, use of alcohol and other drugs, and um, engaging in risky sexual practices. So what I look at when I see this model is that we have still a high level of discrimination, rejection, victimization that's occurring in this community, a lot of non-affirmation. Um, and unfortunately, that's why we're seeing higher physical and mental health outcomes, negative mental and physical health outcomes. Um, and the problem is, is when we don't have this community connectedness and pride, and I think, you know, s what I've heard from people is this feeling of being burdened to providers or burdened t um, in their community or to their families. And so I think that with all of this, um, that's why we might be seeing these high levels of uh, internalizing problems. So what's our role? What can we do? Well, we can help people. <laughs> um, we can assess for gender dysphoria. That's one thing that we can do. Now, this is a whole other talk of what exactly is gender dysphoria. Should it be in the DSM? And um, 
I'm not going to go there right now, but um, right, what we can do is we can assess for a gender dysphoria. We can provide counseling for families. Um, it's sometimes really hard, especially if you're talking about adolescents, um, you know, to have the parents understand what's going on. We can assess for comorbid issues. We can refer. We can refer to support networks and educate and advocate in the community. If you look at the WPATH standards of care, they suggest that treatment providers do a thorough assessment to understand what exactly is the youth or the older adult going through? You know, can, what's their support system like? What are the, what's the stigma that they're experiencing? Where? And do they have the capacity to consent to treatment? Do they understand the risks and benefits, which my uh, colleague Anisha Patel will talk about? And can we understand co-occurring mental health issues? Now, one of the things that they'll talk about in the standards of care is that you need to be stabilized in order to proceed with medical treatment. Now, the question is, what does stabilization mean? And sometimes, if you proceed with the gender-affirming treatment, then you see a decrease in the symptomatology. So sometimes it's a, a chicken and the egg thing, and which one can we really um, work with first? With prepubescent children, um, oftentimes what we're doing is assessing, exploring, offering support for the family, for the child. Are they safe? Are they safe in their family? Are they safe in their community? Are they safe in school? Um, how can we support them with a social transition? Um, interestingly, there have been several studies now um, out of Washington State where uh, Christina Olson and colleagues have looked at mental health outcomes with young children who are allowed to socially transition. And what they have found is that children who are able to socially transition at a young age show no difference in mental health outcomes than their siblings and age-matched peers. So what we're seeing is that in older adults, we're seeing these negative mental health outcomes. But with younger kids, if we're able to get them younger um, and allow them to socially transition and support them, we're not seeing those differences in uh, or the increase in negative mental health outcomes. Now, that is not a longitudinal study. We're waiting for the longitudinal data. Um, once puberty hits, then oftentimes you see an increase in gender dysphoria because somebody is going through puberty in the wrong body. So they're experiencing a period maybe as a trans male, right? That would be very disconcerting as a male to have menstruation, right? Or as a female, feeling like your uh, facial hair is growing. So um, you oftentimes see a, a real increase in um, gender dysphoria. So this is where you might start puberty suppression. And like I said, it's important at this point to really help the parents and help them think through, you know, they might have had these dreams for their child when they were in the womb and as they were younger and they're trying to think about, okay, how do I wrap my head around how to change my mind from all of these particular things that I thought would happen for this youth. So really helping them work through that process is important. They also might be fearful of their child, you know, the victimization that occurs in this population, worrying about if they're going to not go to the bathroom, which oftentimes we see with our kids, um, what that might lead to in terms of uh, UTIs or bowel impaction or something. Um, they also have their own coming out that they have to do to family and friends, and that might be really stressful for them. And all, it is all complicated when maybe family members don't necessarily agree about the best treatment uh, for their youth. So all of that is um, where mental health providers can really play a part in helping these families through this. Now, not all children persist with their transgender identity from prepubescent children through adulthood. While the numbers are, um, while we still are waiting for more longitudinal numbers to really understand the percentages who do and do not persist, there are some correlates to persistence into adulthood. We say that kids are insistent, persistent, consistent, they meet the criteria, they have a high level of body dysphoria, and they have transition. Now, I will do a caveat for this also, that this is oftentimes seen in a binary transgender population. So this is when somebody is transitioning from male to female or female to male. When somebody is gender variant or might be gender flexible, then they might not, you might not see these things in their identity. So um, I think that's really important to, to think about. And then also when working with individuals, if there is delay, it's really important to slow down to help them understand, maybe through drawings or other offerings, what exactly will happen if they 
proceed with either cross-hormone treatment or, cross, uh, or puberty suppressants, and what exactly will happen to their body. Um, I think Dr. Patel will talk a little bit more about that. In our agencies, we can think about the language that we use. Do we offer space for preferred name and pronoun? Or do we just use birth assigned sex and birth name? Um, it's really important to be open and accepting to the trans population to show them that we really care to offer space for that. We also want to watch the terms that we use. And do we say, hey, you guys, right, or something like that? Um, what exactly are, what's our language look like? And asking how partners identify. And if there is um, a trans male who might be interested in having a child in the future, you know, do they, are they thinking about chest feeding instead of breastfeeding? So thinking about language is really, really important. And what we've heard from our from our patients is, when in doubt, ask. Just ask. Ask what their preferred name is or pronoun or what their terminology is for, um, for an exam, et cetera. And then we want to think about our environment. Do we have magazines or anything that looks like someone else? Do we, ha or do we have magazines or pictures that look like trans individuals or gender variant individuals? Um, do we have gender neutral bathrooms? You know, do we make our places of care open and welcoming to the trans or gender variant population? Finally, I just want to end with what is an affirming stance? How can we as providers be affirming to this population? Well, we can understand that gender variance is not a disorder. Presentations are very diverse. There is an interplay between multiple systems in terms of why someone might be transgender or gender nonconforming. This is fluid. Gender is fluid and non-binary. And oftentimes what we're seeing is these, the increase in mental health concerns stem from this negative cultural reaction and are not necessarily within the person. And I'm not saying that people don't have uh, depression or anxiety separate from their gender dysphoria, but oftentimes those things are compounded by the victimization that they're uh, experiencing in their environment. And also connections to the community are very helpful. So if there are groups for individuals or um, places that are really safe queer spaces for them to feel comfortable in, finding those spaces and referring them to those spaces is really, really important. And with that, I am going to pass it on to Dr. Susan Boulware, who is going to talk about our medical transition. All right. Well Thank you. Hello, thank you everybody. I will quickly go through some of the medical and surgical options that we have for trans individuals. And first wanted to, does anybody recognize this couple of kids? So this is Jonas and Nicole Maines and they are 46 XY identical twins. When um, Nicole was about three, she told her father she hated her penis and she wondered when is it gonna fall off? She always identified as female. She always liked girls' clothes. She wanted to play with girls' toys, and she wanted to play with girls. At nine, Jonas said, look, Dad, you've got a son and a daughter. You better face it. So she socially transitioned in fifth grade, medically transitioned in high school, and then had gender-affirming surgery between college and, um, I mean, between high school and college. She's a terrific speaker and advocate for trans issues and has a great TED Talk that I recommend people take a look at if you're interested. Um, I like to start with some of the what I call over-the-counter um, interventions that people have available to them, and the first would be chest binders. So for trans males who are very dysphoric with having breasts, we like to, um, most of these kids know that these binders are available. One of the problems with the binders is they can be very tight, they can cause a lot of bruising, we've seen this in a number of our patients, and they can cause skin breakdown. So the kids need to be informed that they should not wear these 24-7. They need to have a long period of time during the day, they're not wearing these. That, um, and one of the times that kids can be very dysphoric is during um, bedtime. So in, in the bed, at sleep, you feel the breasts, and that just really drives them crazy, if you will. Um, so chest binders. Another are these devices we refer to as STPs, or stand-to-P device. You can see they come in. It's a kind of a flexible molded plastic that can look like genitalia or um, you know, a green cup. Um, but uh, these can really serve two purposes. One is to allow the person to stand to urinate, which is very gender affirming, and the other is to be used as more as packing so that it simulates male genitalia. 
When we talk about, um, begin to look at the medical and surgical interventions, obviously um, these are a little more controversial and um, guidelines have been set forth um, from a number, actually a number of, of uh, societies. The most recent uh, publication was last month in the uh, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Um, multiple co-sponsoring agencies, but the Endocrine Society Clinical Guidelines. And they um, start with that children who have entered into puberty, once you have a confirmed diagnosis or you feel that the patient does have gender dysphoria, um, and we will start blockers, puberty blockers, at, in early puberty, so 10 or stage two to three. Now, there are five stages of puberty, if you guys remember, but the first stage of puberty is nothing, so 10 or one is prepubertal and um, Tanner 5 is all done. So Tanner 2, 3 is really early puberty. And in girls, that means breast development, and natal girls, breast development, which occurs typically around 9 and a half to 10. Boys, the first sign of puberty in a natal male is some testicular enlargement, which begins at an average age of about 11 and a half. So somewhere in that 10 to 12 range, we see some of these changes of puberty, and we can begin these blockers. We use um, Lupron injections, which are given intramuscularly every three months or suprelin implants, which are placed just under the, in the under um, surface of the upper arm. Um, it's a surgeon, we use a surgeon to put these in, but these last probably two years, at least two years. They're marketed for one year. They're lasting in the majority of our patients at least two, and in some cases much longer than that. Um, Cross-hormone therapy, the guidelines suggest starting at about 16 um, after, again, um, diagnosis of gender dysphoria, and the patient is of an age that they can really consent to or assent to this therapy, understand the risks and benefits, understand potential long-term consequences of this therapy, um, and, and be able to consent. Now, there, um, the guidelines do state that they understand that there could be compelling reasons we want to start these hormones at an earlier age. So if the average age of starting puberty in a child is 10 or 11, that means that um, all of their peers are going through puberty. By 16, almost everyone is finished with puberty, right? The natal girls are having periods at 12 and a half. Natal boys are really done with their, their growth spurts. And so you are marginalizing these kids even further by saying, we're going to keep you prepubertal until you're 16 years old. So there, are, there may be compelling reasons, but again, we really need to take into individualized uh, therapy and, and with the individual patient. Gender-affirming surgeries guidelines say at age of 18, so um, the age of consent, uh, there are many people, not huge numbers, but many people are now um, considering top surgery in trans males at 14 or older. Um, all of these therapies should be in concurrence with ongoing mental health care. And again, as Christy was pointing out, it needs to be really individualized care. Some of the non-binary kids really don't need any kind of intervention at all, just really support. Um, so when we're talking about masculinizing therapy, so natal females who are actually trans males, this would be um, decreasing estrogen and increasing testosterone, right? So testosterone can be given by injections, patches, or gels. Uh, the goal is to bring the testosterone into the adult male range, which I've shown here is 350 to 1,000 typically. Um, and then we monitor testosterone levels as well as hematocrit because we can induce polycythemia or high red cell counts cholesterol panel because we can induce um, some increase in LDL or the bad cholesterol, and then screening for organs that still are in place in that particular individual. So if they still have a cervix, they need to have cervical um, screening down the road. That's not for the pediatric group, but um, cervical screening and breast cancer screening as appropriate. Testosterone can be given, like I said, as uh, gels, patches, or injections. We typically have been going with injections. We do have a couple of kids who really have needle phobias, and we were able to start on um, the gel. The gel, as you can, be, can see, is applied. It comes in a little pump, like a Purell pump. You make one or two pumps, depending upon the dosing. Apply it to the skin. One of the problems with the gel, with the problem with the gel and the patches, they have to be done every day. So. You know, getting a teenager to do something every day is hard in and of itself. But um, the gel is applied here. And then it, you, have, you can have person-to-person -person transfer. So not just from your hands, but also from the body. So if the, the trans male has applied the gel and then, you know, is holding a baby, like you're at the, you know, you go to the, the beach or whatever, you don't have your shirt on and you're holding a little baby, that can transfer the gel. It should be dry by 10 minutes. It should not be transferring easily or, or commonly, 
but we have had an experience of a, of a dad came into the general clinic who was using the testosterone gel, was drying off you know, with a particular towel, and the four-year-old girl was also being dried off with that and presented with pubic hair. So there can be transfer, and that, that information makes the kids um, very concerned, and so they're very, you know, they're very appropriately concerned that they don't want to induce you know, pubic hair in their little sisters or facial hair in their mother, so um, this is not a common choice. Transdermal patches are a little bit easier. You can see they're small patches. They're applied in the areas that are shown in purple. Um, again, they have to be done every day, and about a third of kids will have a reaction, like an allergic reaction to the sticky tape that, that, um, that is used on the patch. They are set doses. It's a little harder. Sometimes we can cut them in pieces if it's too high a dose for the individual person, but they work really nicely. And then the injections, you know, that just by saying that injection, that, that um, is, is not so um, palatable, but we've been giving them uh, Recently, we're using subcutaneous injections rather than intramuscular injections, and it works very well, um, and it's much more tolerable. We have generally have our nurses will teach the families how to give these injections. They're given either once a week or once every two weeks. So it's frequent. It's not every day, um, but it's not once a month. So it's, it's or three months. So it's a you know it has to be done frequently, and it's it's too much of a hassle to have to come into the doctor's office and have that done you know, by somebody else. So mom or dad or the patient themselves can learn how to do these injections and take care of that. The effects that we see, some we're looking for, some we're not looking for so much, but uh, we do see a lot of acne in the kids initially when they go on testosterone. So um, we warn them about that and, and you know, really encourage good skin care. Onset of action of acne is pretty quick. One or two months, we often see some acne maximal effect, one to two years. Um, we do have one effect that they're looking for is cessation of menses, um, which will occur in a couple of months. As soon as you get the testosterone level up to certainly 150, 200 nanogram per ml DL, that will um, stop menses. And then we can see some vaginal atrophy, clitoromegaly, body fat redistribution, facial hair, which tends to be a little bit longer in coming than a lot of the kids would like. Muscle mass and strength really is dependent upon how, not only your testosterone levels, but your, you know, how much are you working out and exercising. And then deepening of the voice, which is often in the first several months of treatment. Um, and people need to be warned about hair loss. So genetics, if you're in a family that has male pattern balding, then this is going to be more common in the trans males in that family. For feminizing therapy, which is a little more difficult, you have to block testosterone, which is much, much more powerful, if you will, hormone than estrogen, um, and then add the estrogen. So uh, feminizing therapies, we can do what we really do like the blockers because it does block uh, testosterone production very well. In, in children that we can't use that for whatever reason, we can do a spironolactone, which is actually an antihypertensive that has some effects to block the androgen receptor. It has a little bit of an effect to lower testosterone levels as well, but primarily it's blocking um, action. So we will use spironolactone and then estrogen, which like testosterone can be given as pills, patches, or injections, but also can be given orally, which is our most common method in the kids. Um, and we typically use the 17 beta estradiol. So we monitor, as shown, their estradiol levels. We try to keep them in the normal adult range, which is going to be in the range of two to 300 um, picogram per ml, and monitor cholesterol because estrogen can cause increased levels of triglycerides, and then potassium if they happen to be on spironolactam because that can induce <coughs> increase your potassium levels. Uh, prolactin, estrogen can sometimes cause an increase in prolactin. And then blood pressure, we look for um, thromboembolic disease, obviously, and then uh, if they have a prostate, they need to be screened for prostate cancer down the road at, at age-appropriate time. Feminizing therapy um, increases breast development. Many trans individuals are not happy with the amount of breast growth that can occur trying to increase, uh, trying to induce breast development in an adult or an older adolescent is difficult. Um, and sometimes a lot of patients will go on to want implant surgery as well. Uh, body fat redistribution to be a more hippie appearance rather than um, abdominal fat. We do see decrease in libido and erections, and many of the um, trans females are, are happy with that effect. Um, decrease in muscle mass. We see testicular volume shrink somewhat, but not significantly, and decrease in sperm production. 
And then the skin becomes softer, there's less facial and body hair, and a decrease prevention of uh, male pattern baldness. So when we move to um, surgical interventions for, you can envision what kinds of surgeries we do. For female to male, we do top surgery, which would be the more um, appropriate phrase now rather than mastectomy, just to try to be um, cognizant of a um, person's feelings. Phalloplasty, uh, which can be with or without testicular prostheses and a penile implant. We'll do removal of the vagina, removal of the, um, the ovaries and, and uh, uterus, and then chest contouring. For male to female, uh, removal of the penis, the gonads, breast augmentation, vaginoplasty, femino, feminine facialization, facial feminization, a glottoplasty, which is a shaving of the, of the vocal cords so that the, the tone of the voice is a higher pitched rather than a lower pitch, which is a more testosterone driven sound. And then thyrochondroplasty, which is a shaving of the Adam's apple. The uh, top surgery really is in the hands of the surgeon um, and with, with the individual, the decision is made whether the patient wants a, a flatter chest or a chest that, that has more sensation. You, you end up cutting nerves and can ca cause some numbness on the chest. So with smaller uh, chested uh, individuals, one can do this, this keyhole type surgery, which does allow more um, a flat chest, but also more sensation. For larger chested people, you may need this double incision. This has been fairly common. Um, this was a pretty early after, you know, just a, like a week, 10 days after surgery, so the, the scars are still pretty red. That will lighten and uh, become more skin toned. But you can see there's, it's not just, um, sorry, it's not just taking away breast tissue, right? It's, re, it's redoing, you have to have plastic surgeon that can reshape the nipple and place the nipple on the chest to a male appearance of the chest. So it's not just a mastectomy, if you will. Male genital um, construction, so this is taking uh, female genitalia and um, to, to become more the appearance of male genitalia. So metoidioplasty is a procedure in which the clitoris is enlarged and then the appearance of the clitoris is enlarged by doing some surgical procedures by releasing the clitoral ligaments. Um, you can use the mucosa from the vagina to make a urethra and then allow this individual to have the urethral opening at the tip of the clitoris. Um, and skin from the labia is used to enclose the, the, um, the urethra. And this is an example of a trans male who has had metoidioplasty. You can see that the clitoris is a little bit enlarged. It will enlarge under testosterone therapy, but probably maximum size of two and a half, three inches. Um, but on the, the right, you see the, uh, the refashioned uh, urethra coming through the tip of the clitoris. For more extensive surgery would be phalloplasty or forming um, a phallus, a penis, scrotoplasty and testicular implants and penile implant. The, the surgeon um, will make a decision as to where, so what the, the surgeon does is take some donor skin and muscle and, and make a penis. Um, in this particular case, we're using radial forearm flap. It's a, it's a full thickness flap that takes skin muscle fat as well as nerves, veins, and arteries. And um, to be uh, showed that, the, you know, the, the, these are not simple procedures. These are really difficult procedures. They are painful procedures. They take a lot of time to heal, and there are a lot of complications. Um, this is looking at the um, taking the donor flap, and then the skin is rolled. Um, a urethra is, is formed that goes through this um, phallus, and then the phallus is attached to the individual. What you can see here, so these are two different patients. The former one was a radial forearm, which surgeons like because it has very good blood supply and very good nervous supply, and there is a lot of sensation on the phallus. It's not erotic sensation, but it's sensation. Um, in this case, the surgeon has used the lateral thigh. Many surgeons will use the latissimus dorsi, so these are different areas. You can use the suprapubic area as well. In this case, the patient has the penis that has been attached um, from the thigh. And you know, a couple of points. One is that this is not erectile tissue. This is muscle and fat. So whatever is attached to the individual suprapubic area, that's what is there. And so we've had one surgeon we heard talk about patients coming in saying they wanted a 10-inch you know, a, a penis. 
And she said, well, you know, that, it's there. It, there's, you know, it doesn't go back. It, it, whatever you get is what you get. So you really need to be conscious of, you know, do you really want a 10-inch penis or could you go with a 7? Um, it was really it's very cute. Um, the other is that wherever your donor site is has a huge, ugly, very obvious scar, right? So you see the thigh scar there. If it happens to be on the forearm, that's pretty visible a lot of times. You know, that's visible like all summer when you're wearing short sleeves. Um, so the thigh is often nice just from the sense of having a little bit of um, privacy and autonomy about this. The back is good, but the forearm is great because of the vascular supply and the nervous supply. For female construction, again, you know, take off the penis, get rid of the, um, the gonads, and then really the formation of uh, vagina is um, difficult. These require, the, usually we use the skin from the penis that's used, it's inverted, and, and a vagina is formed from that. Um, formation of the labia minora is a difficult technically, is, a diff is difficult technically, um, and the vagina requires lifelong dilatation and lubrication. So there's 10, 20 percent of these will, will stenose and make difficult for penetrative sex. Another issue with, again, I always like to emphasize that these, are, these, these procedures are really, really difficult and they're really painful. And for the trans female, um, three, four months before surgery, you go in and get electrolysis on your scrotum to remove all of this hair because this, this skin is what's used to form the vagina and you don't want hair re vagina. So the first, the first thing you have to do is three months of electrolysis, which hurts, guys, that really hurts. Um, and, then, um, and then go in. The surgeon has identified where he's making his, his incisions and the purple lines. So you flay back the skin, take off the penis, and this is a before and after picture um, on the right, which is, you know, a very nice result. For feminization surgery, facial feminization surgery, just showing the differences in male and female skulls, to look at the male skull, basically gestalting it is, is a little more angular, and the sloped of the, the forehead is a little more sloped. So we can do forehead contouring, brow ridge shaving, revision uh, nose job, rhinoplasty, cheek augmentation, jaw reduction, skin shaving, and thyroid cartilage shaving. And many trans individuals will say, this is the most important um, intervention that they can have or have had. Because every morning, they get up as a woman, and they look in the mirror, and they don't see a woman's face. And it is just demoralizing. So this is, becomes, you know, this is not just plastic surgery. This is life-saving surgery. Um, this is Lynn, again immediately post-op, just to you know, drive home the point that it is hard to undergo, um, but she had a great um, outcome. And then to leave you with um, a little bit of the story of, of Michael uh, Dillon, who was born Laura Maud in 1915, always identified as male, in, um, in the mid-third, in the mid 40s, he actually heard of, a, of a, a physician who was using testosterone in women with menstrual irregularities, and he went to this physician and said, can I have some of that? I want to masculinize. And the physician said, well, why don't you go see a psychiatrist and, you know, see if that'll help you. He comes back, he said, they didn't talk me out of it, you know, I really need this medication. So he um, took the medication. He wrote a book later, he went to medical school and wrote a book. Um, a study in ethics and endocrinology, and the quote from the book is, where the mind cannot be made to fit the body, the body should be made to fit approximately at any rate to the mind, despite the prejudices of those who have not suffered these things. And I'll pass it on to Anisha. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Um, I will start by saying I don't have any graphic pictures, <laughs> but I do have the pleasure of telling you a little bit about the, our Yale Gender Program. So it's an interdisciplinary clinic, and we, um, in every patient in our clinic is usually seen by an endocrinologist. So it's myself, Dr. Susan Bulwer, or Stu Weinzimmer, and then we always have uh, a representative of a mental health team. So Christie's always there, and then we have uh, psychology and psychiatry fellows that also work with us, and they uh, do a lot of the evaluations under Christie's guidance. Um, we, after 
clinic, we usually have rounds. So in rounds, we will have uh, Dr. Tim Van Dusen and Gordon Weiss, who are from psychiatry, to help guide us with difficult uh, patients. Um, we also have Alice Rosenthal, who's the lawyer for the hospital, who volunteers some of her time and um, uh, helps us with many issues, including you know uh, health insurance things, a legal name change, uh, many different legal issues that come forth uh, that she's helpful with. Um, and then we're very lucky to have Dr. David Hurst, who's actually the head of the ethics committee in the hospital, and she, he helps us uh, guide uh, many of the, uh, some of the questions that are raised on individual case basis. Um, we also work with surgical specialists and GYN, reproductive uh, um, endocrinologists and uh, reproductive um, uh, fertility preservation folks on a need basis. Uh, we are currently seeing children, adolescents, and young youth between the age of 3 to 25. Um, and so that's the basic structure of our, uh, our clinic. And I will tell you a little bit about a patient because I think that um, I always remind all our students that work with us that sometimes you learn the best medicine from your patient and they, they uh, it, uh, kind of force you to explore areas that you may have never gone. And I think that um, my journey into providing uh, trans-affirming care uh, really came from a patient. So I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about EM. He's a 12-year-old natal male who presented um, uh, for gender-affirming treatment. And um, the story was more on the binary. So at about three to four years of age, preferred to play with do dolls and wear sisters' clothes. Um, you know, the family psychosocial structure was so that basically the, these gender expressions weren't affirmed at a very young age. And at about 10 years of age, experienced suicidal ideation, was hospitalized and underwent uh, therapy subsequently. And during treatment for this is when um, she disclosed to her family that she really is a woman and wants to be a woman. And so the family's initial goal with us was really to undergo a social transition because at that time they were still using the birth assigned pronouns and what they, people now call dead name. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, so we, that was their, their first goal. Uh, her past medical history was uh, significant for ADHD. She, uh, she was on um, Ritalin for that. And social history, uh, this individual really had the support of her mother. And her mother, when she first came to us, was, couldn't, had a lot of barriers. And the first barrier was, I want this patient to graduate with the given name from middle school. So I don't, I want to delay the transition for another two years. And we're like, okay, well, l let's talk about this. Um, she had a sister who lived in the house who was not supportive, a uh, father who was not really involved. Uh, she ran into father at the corner grocery store every once in a while had lots of extended family around who were very, not very supportive. So the only source of support for this individual was mom who was not quite there yet, it was trying to get there. Um, she experienced some bullying at school and uh, this happened several times. And actually mom uh, became very, uh, um, uh, became a voice and advocated for this child and got True Colors involved, which is a nonprofit organization that provides uh, education for LGBTQ issues. Uh, she also got involved in student council, uh, started gay straight alliances. Um, and then the other, so she uh, subsequently got adequate support in school. The other issue that we face is that she was allowed to dress as a girl on the weekend and holidays, but during the week had to wear boy clothes she was very close to her young nieces and nephews, and if she wanted to go visit them, she had to dress as a boy, and she, it, this continues. So there was a, a lot of issues going on. Um, she chose a name after her, her grandmother who, who had deceased, and she used that name for several months, and we even uh, were using this in clinic, and then one day she came back and said, oh, my extended family kind of forbade me to use that name because they thought that 
uh, she was defaming the grandmother, so she was really forced to change her name once again. Um, her highlight in clinic is always she's a dancer. She'll share a little video clip of performances she do, uh, has done all around school and social gatherings, so th that always made her excited. She's sexually interested in boys and uh, did not use any uh, uh, drugs. Um, her developmental history was very interesting. There were some delays in early childhood. She repeated preschool twice. She had an IEP in place currently in school. Um, and then when we did the readiness evaluation, Christy did the evaluation, and you know, the gender expression was consistent, persistent from very early childhood. And there was like no question, she always felt like a girl. Um, she wanted biological children, and mom wanted her to freeze her sperm, and so that, that was very clear. We also discovered a very enmeshed relationship between mom and this child to the point where, um, you know, the first thing that kind of uh, flagged was flagged is when Christy did some of the psychological tools, she saw the validity measures showed inconsistency, so there was inconsistent response for the same question. And, and then we also realized after getting to know the family a little bit that mom would complete the sentence for this child. Um, we tried to get mom to wait outside while we had this child complete the, some of the measures and mom just melted down and kind of stormed out, uh, you know, really angry. And Renee, who's in the audience, audience is one of our nurse coordinator, actually ran after mom and kind of calmed her down and <laughs> brought her back. So we knew something was going on. We also discovered mom was taking uh, EM to her personal dates. Uh, she was also participating in every single individual session, psychological sessions that this person was having. So she refused to wait outside while this person was getting therapy. So we, we realized that there was a lot of different uh, things going on that we needed to work out. Eventually we got school reports and I kind of vividly remember the date when Christy's like, I got the school reports. And we, you know, the full scale IQ for this individual was 64. So there was some limitation and um, I think it was compensated by this enmeshed relationship because mom was able to kind of fill in the gaps when there were gaps. Um, so, um, and then we also discovered that there was no ADHD and probably there was some cognitive limitation very early in childhood that were kind of mistook as uh, attention issues. And so we, we said, um, you know, we probably don't need to do anything about that at this moment. Our first, uh, this was our first uh, case that kind of said, okay, we need an ethicist here to help us figure out because this person, do they have the, uh, you know, to provide uh, consent, a capacity to consent? And do they have an understanding of fertility issues? When we started talking a little bit about fertility uh, preservation with this individual, we realized that she thought by taking estrogen, she was going to grow a uterus and would be able to really carry a child. So we knew that we needed to take a few steps back. Um, eventually, Christy actually met with the family, showed them some basic pictures of this is a boy, this is a girl, taking estrogen is, this is what would happen and you're not gonna get a uterus, you know? So to kind of scale back on how we were presenting the information and trying to meet the patient where they were. Um, you know, basically uh, the principle, so w with the ethicists, we went through the four basic principle of ethics and so autonomy, benefits, uh, beneficence, uh, best interest of the patient, uh, basically to do no harm, um, and to kind of understand the decision the patient's making now may have kind of long-term lasting effects on their psychosocial environment. Uh, there may be a permanence uh, to the choice that the, they're making but then the final thing that we talked about that kind of resonated with me was the principle of justice. We as a provider have an obligation to act on the basis of fairness, enti entitlement, and equality, regardless of patient's gender, race, ethnicity, cognitive capacity, especially in this case where there was persistent insistence of gender expression. Um, so with that, we just kind of moved forward and uh, supported the family 
help them make a social change. We finally got uh, mom on board, and it's it's been a nice journey where mom was gender affirming just in the pronouns and name as 0% of the time when we first saw her, and she's now probably at 90, 95%. So we've slowly over a couple of years have made a progression. She is dressing, I would say, 95% of the time as a woman. Um, she still has to, she's not allowed to wear um, uh, female clothing when she visits her niece and nephews, so that's another thing still they're struggling with. Mom and patient started to get separate counseling, which was a huge breakthrough because, um, you know, the, the, that took us a while to convince mom that she needed to do. Um, also, kind of shortly after we saw her, she started to express dysphoria with the development of body hair. Uh, she's been on uh, Lupron, which is a GnRH analog or puberty blocker for the last couple of years. Um, you know, and so we're getting to a point where we're starting to talk a little bit more and more about estrogen. We've had further discussion about reproductive options. And um, the, one of the caveats is, you know, in order to, one of the best way to preserve fertility for natal males is uh, sperm cryopreservation. And in order for that to happen, you have to allow natal puberty to progress to at least the mid to later stages of puberty. And so if you're on a puberty blocker, you, you may not be able to have a specimen. So, so to understand that it actually in order to have biological children, you have to allow natal fertility, uh, natal puberty to occur at this time. Um, you know, that's another thing that we are working with the family to do. And so with that, what are the effects of feminizing treatment on reproductive organs? So very simply, you know, it reduces sperm counts, it can alter morphology, it uh, alters sperm motility. So there is, and it's a dose-based relationship. The higher the estrogen dose, the longer the duration of treatment, the more it's going to have effect on the natal fertility. Um, what are some of the fertility options? So, um, you know, for... I think trans women, it's a little bit more simpler, but the first uh, established method is sperm cryopreservation. It's non-invasive. Again, you have to be post-pubertal. You, you have to be able to produce a sample, and we know this from our kids who have Kleinfelters or other medical issues that you can't give a teenager a cup and a magazine and be expected to generate a sample. It just doesn't happen because it's just difficult for them to actually do that. I think there's another layer to that for our trans kids because there's kind of a body dysphoria. There's a lot of times they don't want to acknowledge the natal organs, so then to use those organs to actually do something with it, it's really difficult. Um, there's also costs that go along with fertility preservation. Most insurance companies are not paying for these uh, treatments, so um, that becomes a big barrier as well in, in, in terms of uh, speaking about fertility options. Uh, surgical extraction of sperm can happen. Again, there's no masturbation that's required, uh, so that's one positive about it, but you have to be post-pubertal. There's a surgical procedure. The cost includes now the surgical procedure plus the cost of storage. Um, testicular tissue can also be preserved, and now so you just take biopsy of the testes and freeze it. Um, th the benefit of this is it can be done if prepubertal stage. Um, it's completely experimental, so there's studies now that have produced eggs and, I mean, uh, pigs and chickens and mice, but there are no humans that have been conceived using this method. People think, uh, you know, the, the fertility medicine is moving rapidly. Um, I think the techniques are going to become more and more uh, viable to allow for this to happen. So many fertility centers will store testicular tissue now um, in hopes to use it then in vitro later to have mature sperm. So again, costly, five to 10,000. What are the effects of masculizing treatment on gonads? So for trans men, it basically testosterone treatment causes what we think like a reversible amenorrhea. And I always remind our trans men, testosterone is not a 
birth control. So if you are on testosterone, there is a risk of pregnancy if you have natal organs. Um, so we remind them to use barriers. <laughs> um, also, so testosterone in general can cause some uh, uh, effects like PCO. So you have enlargement of the ovaries, you have collagenation and hyperplasia of certain ovarian cells. And uh, PCO is associated with decreased rates of fertility or more difficulty with fertility. So that could be seen. So once you stop testosterone and want to have uh, children, it may take a little bit of time to get there. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of information here, but um, I will quickly go through that. Um, what are the fertility options for trans male? The most established methods are either oocyte cryopreservation or embryo cryopreservation. For um, oocyte cryopreservation, the, the um, success rates are about six to eight live births for 100,000 eggs. So one cycle will kind of yield anywhere about 20 to 30 eggs. So you're talking about one or two live births if you go through one cycle of um, oocyte cryopreservation. You do not need a sperm source. You just basically, uh, um, you can just store the eggs and then when you're ready to have children, you would then have to find a sperm, sperm source. Uh, again, you have to be post-pubertal and you have to undergo hormonal stimulation and those hormonal stimulation includes, you know, uh, uh, FSH and basically opposite of what your affirmed gender uh, hormones are. So that could be very stressful, distressful for a uh, trans individual. Very, very costly. Each step has uh, multiple thousands dollars attached to it. So it can cost anywhere from 20 to, you know, 40,000 to get there. And so if the insurances are not covering, that becomes a big barrier for many of our, our families and patients. Um, Embryo cryopreservation, it's an established method. Again, you have to be post-pubertal. You have to go through hormone uh, stimulation. A sperm source is needed. The success rates are probably slightly better than o oocyte cryopreservation, but similar. Um, again, expensive. Um, there is experimental methods, including in vitro maturation of um, uh, 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 ovarian kind of tissue. So basically what happens is they, uh, um, you can take unstimulated ovaries and then later time use it and use in vitro to mature, mature the eggs. One live birth is reported, so still pretty experimental. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation. So this data comes from oncology literature. Um, and so they can take a piece of ovary, freeze it, and then when the same individual is ready to have a child, they re-implant the ovarian tissue, um, and then basically you develop a neo-ovary, and they can use the uh, eggs from that neo-ovaries to have children. There are about 20 live births that have been reported with this technique, so it's still limited. It's not available everywhere, um, and it's the same thing with whole ovaries. So the first two techniques are really the the best established techniques. And so that's all I have, and with that I'll leave you with a little bit of information about our clinic. Our clinic is at One Long Wharf, uh, that's our number, um, and then uh, that's, uh, that's all. <laughs>